If game show hosts are accorded scant respect by the critics, the pillows they cry into at night are at least well stuffed with money. Seasoned practitioners earn more than a million dollars a year, and even a comparative novice can pull down half a million. Mind you, it could be argued that they earn their money. Very often they have to record five programmes a day, and the prospect of dealing with that much banality could very easily drive a man to drink. Indeed, in one case, it may already have done so. A certain game show host, so it is said, copes with the pressure by tippling steadily throughout the day, and devoted followers of his programme claim to be able to tell simply by judging the apparent state of his sobriety at which precise point in the day any particular programme was recorded. Would you like to be queen for the day? Game shows come and game shows go, but some leave a lasting impression on the lives of the contestants. Thank you. Welcome to a very special show. Today we have a special theme. You're going to be delighted with the whole half hour. All right, we will now start our meeting. Oh, Lord, grant that each one who has to do with us today may be the happier for it. Queen for a Day started on radio, transferred to TV, and finally expired in the 1960s. Gone, but not forgotten. The motto of this club for surviving ex-queens is Queen for a Day, Queen Forever. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Every month, these instant monarchs of TV meet to recall what was for many of them the most exciting day of their lives. You may be seated. Now let's have a queen. Please don't whistle or shout, just applaud number one was Mrs. Ruth Davidson. Mrs. Davidson lives way up in the mountains in Colorado, and she'd like a stove and a heater. You're applause for number one. On the show, contestants had to reveal why they should be elected queen, usually by telling some sad story. Not too sad, you understand. Terminal illness was out. I mean, this is TV, for heaven's sake. Let's get a little uplift here. She'd like a king-sized bed for her husband, number two. The story's told. The applause of the studio audience elected the winner. Thank goodness for the kids. I crown you Queen Jerry. Queen for the day. All the way over here from Carl's Hollywood, our floors. Erlene, what was your story when you got to be queen for a day? Well, I had a, a, have a son who was eight years old, and he had polio, and he was on crutches for three and a half years. And his incentive to get off of him was to play baseball. So he got off the crutches, and he was pitching for Little League, and one foot smaller than the other. So he needed a special shoe, and they gave him that and gave me so many things. I had a son that uh, had been in an automobile accident and was paralyzed from the shoulder blades down, and the other son had been killed. And uh, he was in the hospital, and uh, I asked for a wheelchair and drafting tools for him. What did they do for you to make that day memorable? Oh, it was so special. Uh, you went and had makeup done and your hair, and of course you got all the gifts and the robe and the crown, and uh, then we went on a whirl. We were at the Beachcombers, and Clark Gable was uh, sitting nearby, and uh, he started to choke, and he didn't have any water yet, so I took him over my water <laughs> and patted him on the back, and he quit choking. So in a little while, he came over and asked me to dance. Oh, marvelous. That was so special. Today, 20 years later, the ex-queens take it in turns to relive their big moment. I now crown you queen for a day, Queen June Kaufman. Thank you. Thank you. We don't have a royal family where we can identify with royalty and live a fantasy life. So our royalty is the movie star, uh, the television star, and if you are in a game show for that moment, you are a television star. Now, being on a game show, does that give you a kind of celebrity? Do people recognize you well, in the street? Well, people recognize me like six months after I got a, I've gotten like three phone calls from people that have like found my name in the phone book or something and called me up some guy from new york that i talked to for several months <laughs> yeah he kept calling me back he was really nice i was kind of glad he was in new york you know i mean i didn't really want to meet him or anything but we would be eating in a restaurant and my food would get cold because people were coming up and talking to us and i don't, I don't think it's something you can really become upset about because it's just human nature in a way uh game shows are the 
you could say the common man's Olympics. <laughs> it, it's a way to emerge briefly from the crowd and to be somebody special. Right. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as Rocky said, to show I'm not another bum from the neighborhood. <laughs> people are preparing part of a new game show which according to its producers will be the most expensive ever made with a total investment of four million dollars. Much of that expenditure will be on elaborate setups like this wherein hidden cameras spy on an actor who's trying to persuade passers-by to rescue his credit card from the claws of a lobster. What the actor has to discover is how much money, $10, 20 250 it would take to persuade people to help him. Behind this and similar jolly pranks is the glum philosophy of the show, namely that, as the title suggests, people will do anything for money. I can't get him to take it. You can take a vacation with her. Oh, he got it. There you go. All right, he got it. <laughs> Wrong kind? Oh. When all is prepared, the film crew conceals itself in these unmarked blue vans and waits for some innocent victim. I was fooling around here with my credit card here, and I dropped it in. I'd give you $10, Menachem, if you'll take that out of there for me, will you? The, the guy, I had a guy here working on it, trying to get it out, and he got caught by one of the pinchers, but he was slow. If you're fast, you can do it. I'll give you $20, Menachem. Just reach in quickly and get it. If you're fast, you'll be all right. What's going to happen if he bites me? Huh? Well, uh, uh, they got some bandages in the back, just like for the last guy, but it, uh, it'll probably be okay. What is that long thing? Huh? That thing hurts this long? It all hurts. Just stay out of the way of everything and reach down with two. I'll give you $30, Menachem, if you reach down in there quickly and get your hand out quickly with my card in it. It's right there. Here's the $30, Cat. Uh, let, huh? let me wait till he drops his leg. I got to hurry, Menachem, but be careful. Will you put, wait a minute, you're going to do it for $30? I'll try it. If you yell, maybe it'll scare him. Here you go. Yeah! And reach in there, you know? Try that. Go ahead. Like yell when you do it. This guy's Like a warrior. Go ahead. Get out of if, That scares him? Yeah, I think so. Let him know who's boss. More, more, more. That did it. Go, you almost had it. Go on, that's it. I'm shaking all over. Let me tell you. I know, and you're terrific. Go on, and I can get it. Ah! <gasps> oh, okay. Now it's a little easier. Now a it's little easy. more. Right. <laughs> Welcome back. Our contestants were asked to decide who cost us the most money. A woman asked to sell her shoes, or a man asked to pull a credit card out of a tank of live lobsters. Five checkers. I don't know if we've ever had a five checker. No, no, five. One, David, what is it about the ingredients of this show that makes you think it's going to be a success? Um, it's funny. Funny usually is successful. Funny with real people seems to be even more successful. So I think one of the key ingredients to any game show is participation by the viewer at home. What would I do if I was approached in the street and asked to put my hand in a lobster tank, sell my bra, sell my pants, uh, eat a food sample that, that you don't, that, that somebody's offering to you, that you later find out might be, uh, you're told that it's ground worms, which is a new delicacy from France, or Peruvian cockroaches. Incidentally, who thinks up all these stunts? Because you can need a lot of stunts, aren't you, at five or six per program? We have five people locked in a room. We feed them food under their doors. If they're lucky. If they're lucky. If they come up with funny stuff. No, we have writers who work on the show who come up with these bits. Uh, before we are finished with production, the lobster tank one, for example, is one of approximately 750 that we will be uh, shooting. In the viewing room, the stunts are assessed and edited down to three-minute chunks, three minutes being apparently all a TV audience can take at any one time. If the victim has made the producers laugh and signed a release form, then he'll be shown in the best possible taste, of course, on the program. We will not abuse people, we will not intimidate them, we will not make fun of them. Uh, ultimately, it's done, uh, I think, in good taste, uh, and really honoring the human spirit, not demeaning it. Am I doing something crazy here? No. You're helping me 